Why don't you guys just tell me, uh, just mention your name and whatever project you're working on so I can uh, keep up with what everybody's doing here. Okay. Want to go first? Me first. Yeah. I was first in the door. So. <laughs> <clears throat> My name is Kathy Walter. I work with Kindle Publishing, hmm. uh, the Institute for Neuroscience and Consciousness Studies. Hmm. And screenplay writing, these are things, meetup type things I'm mentioning. And I am interested in alternative health. Go on. Uh, yeah, I have uh, four books in print on Amazon and four books uh, on Kindle, uh, ebooks in Amazon, and I have four books on ebooks on, in the iTunes store. Uh, it is just keep in mind that if Amazon catches you, they'll reduce your commission from 70 to 30 percent if you do that. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I know that. I'm, and iTunes is such a small, I mean, it's like I'm less than 2 percent. I'm and I'm not getting much at all from it. Yeah, iTunes. I would take that off just, yeah. just between you and me. Yeah. Well, that's, I, I've been thinking about that. These books that I think. So, how do you, spe how do you spell your name, real, Angel? K A T Y A. K A T. Y A. Y A. And your last name last is? Last name Walter, W A L T E R. And are you publishing under your name or pen names? No, I'm publishing under my name. I'll okay. show you. Let me see. Oh, it's okay. I can look it up. We'll, we'll keep it short for right now. Okay. Uh, insistence I would enjoy is uh, I need to learn how to promote my books. My emphasis is on writing. My topic is stuff that I want to write really well. I used to teach at UT. I left there and went on a whole different kind of journey, writing physics and metaphysics. Uh, I can provide specialties in InDesign, Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator skills. Um, I'm not really good in that stuff, but I'm good enough to do all my own work. And you said you were running meetups or? No. Um, okay. I just named some meetups I'm in. Yeah, I, 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 one of the things I'd recommend since you're, um, have you read chapter 55 of my book? Yeah, I read it. Okay, so, um, yeah, especially, and also chapter 31 and 32 about direct traffic I'm and meetup. Yeah, yeah, I don't know much about all of that. And 31, 32, I read 55. Yeah, so um, just in general, uh, meetup uh, goes through the process of, of um, siloing out or warming up markets. In other words, they divide people into niches and those people camp on different niches. Like if you're using Meetup, you know that you can camp on different topics and you'll get a note that says, you know, some new metaphysical uh, Meetup has started and would you like to check it out? Have you gotten those notes? I don't know what you mean by camp. Well, just to answer, you've gotten the, the notes from Meetup. Yes, that's that means you're camped on. That's this. why you're, that means okay. you're camped on those topics. Okay. Yeah, I see what you're saying. I don't. I didn't know that word. Yeah. Yes. So, um, I, well, they don't use it. I don't, they don't oh, even. They don't it. even okay. talk. They don't even talk about it because none of the links are public anymore. Unless you know how to get to the links, you can't even get to them anymore. That's why I published all those links in my book. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's in chapter 32 mm -hmm. about okay. how to navigate. These because, are things I don't know. Well, so here's the th here's the thing about uh, um, a couple of really quick. Um, Techniques I've been using to um, promote my uh, Kindle books, which are uh, pretty elegant, is um, uh, I've been doing things like um, like I'm in the process of publishing my first WordPress plugin, mm -hmm. and it's really simple, but it it, it accomplishes something that nobody else is doing, which I require. Mm -hmm. And as a, as payment for that, if you like it, then I tell people, we'll just go buy a copy of my book and give me an Amazon review. Mm -hmm. uh, also, a lot of the, um, like the low dollar sorts of things that I offer, like, um, oh, uh, health consulting, or I uh, consult with people about how to speed up their websites. So there's all sorts of things I do, and I've rolled up a lot of those front-end products that range at around the $200 mark mm -hmm. uh, to, well, you can go ahead and pay the 200 or well, up until the point I get 100 reviews on this book, you can go just buy the book for 10 bucks and do a review. So mm -hmm. your choice, $200, $10. Mm -hmm. But you got to do a really good review, and I tell people how to do a review. You, you put the date, you did the review, colon, chapter, Where colon. Where do you put that? Because 
Go I'm look not at going to write you a review till I ask you what you want. We'll just go look on. Uh, I, I've got that outlined on crazyfastwebsites.com. There's a whole little section about, and I'm going to roll that up into some sort of content where I can point people because most people don't really have a clue as to how to do a good review. I know. And especially if you're swapping, like you've got four books, so uh, the other tre technique you can do is just go to your bookshelf, which is what I do. Is uh, every day I go and look on my bookshelf and I say, you know, what's one of my favorite books, and I pull it down. And I go and write a really good review for some chapter out of that book. And then I contact the author and say, yo, dude, I either by phone or Skype or email or something, and say, I just gave you a stellar review for your book, which I have a physical copy in my hand on my mm -hmm. bookshelf. So I actually bought a copy of your book. Mm -hmm. So I'm an Amazon verified buyer of the book. Mm -hmm. So as a courtesy, I'd like for you to go buy my Kindle book and give me a review as good, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the same format. Mm -hmm. And you know, if my book sucks, that's fine. You can say that, mm -hmm. uh, that's fine by me, just as long as you- are asking for the review. Yeah. Uh, so those are the, and also like for this meetup, um, in the past I've just, you know, made meetups available for free and, you know, people will consult with me as a back end then sometimes. And what I've done instead is make the admission for these and a lot of, uh, I was just spoke at two masterminds over the weekend. Um, and a lot of guys are, have switched over to doing that for all their free public meetups is they've started charging the admission is, you know, buy my book, give me a review. So is Mastermind a, a generic name for different branches? Well, um, technically, a ma act technically, this would be more of a think tank. A Mastermind is in the spirit of, um, hey Clint, in the, the spirit of, um, um, oh geez, the guy's name's escaping. Who wrote Think and Grow Rich? Napoleon Hill. Hill, yeah, I'm not. I was just reading through his, a bunch of his books today, and uh, I got too much stuff in my brain. I'm balancing. I've been debugging thesis code with Pearson, and it's got it's. I got thesis code in my brain, and it's it's got me. That was your show and tell oh. Hill stuff. Um, well, in in the spirit of Hill, the true definition of a mastermind really is a group of people that um, uh, commingle their spiritual wells. So this isn't really a mastermind because we ain't, you know, commingling our spiritual wells and actually working towards a common, um, you know, end point. Um, so this is more of a think tank or, um, a, you know, mastermind light. <laughs> okay. So that's, a, but Napoleon Hill and uh, Think and Grow Rich and the 17 Success Principles and he's got, I probably, I bet I've got 15 or 20 different books written by him. He's a very prolific author. Yeah, I know the name. I think I've read one of them. Very, very, very prolific. Mm -hmm. And uh, so t tell me your name again and what you're working on. My name is Mark Fennell, Fennell. and I've been working on energy technology books. Oh, okay. So the, the idea is... Hi. Howdy. Have, have a seat. Yeah. Thank you. So you're working on energy... Um, yes. Well, the, the idea is that... I believe energy technology is important. There are a lot of options out there, but most people don't know the science that well. I came from a science teaching background, and I used that experience to get all the technology in ways that anybody can understand. So if you haven't, if your last high school, your last technical class was in high school 10, 15 years ago, but you still want to know the options available hazards and pollution and then how to prevent those this is uh, this well there's all sorts of weird issues too like the the one of the biggest boondoggles around are electric cars and wind turbine farms mm -hmm. i mean th th those are some of the most harsh environmentally destructive technologies on the planet right now mm -hmm. but most people think oh i got a hybrid car i'm doing a good thing or oh they're setting up these wind turbine farms here mm -hmm. and oh it's a good thing what yeah, about but, what about ethanol uh, drinking or <laughs> or uh, running your car? Yeah. Well, I mean, running your car on it's definitely you know does um, clean things up, and there's you know beneficial ways and unbeneficial ways to do that. Now, the interesting thing about what ethanol I've read is it's energy negative. It takes more to make it than it, it depends on how the how it's grown. You know how the biomass is grown. Like for example, Brazil. You know those guys. You know, right now, Brazil is the only self-sustained. Uh, all-inclusive economy. They could close their borders and they could thrive. Mm. 
and they were able to in a three years three calendar years they just said yeah I think we need to change all our consumer vehicles over to biofuel three years they did it the whole country now you got to think that you know there's some pretty smart people here in the US and if we were really serious about doing it that we could you know do it in at least three years right because it's just those Brazilians down there south so you know yeah you guys that are living in Brazil right now I know there's some Brazilians that listen to this tape and I ain't dissing you I'm just mentioning that you know it ain't because we can't do it here it's because there's too much you know money involved in keeping us from doing it yeah so lack the will and the desire to get it done well it's it's uh, it would disrupt all the the uh, big money flowing into big oil's pockets mm. Yeah, that's pretty amazing too because I think one of their mottos is something to the effect of why do it today when it could be done tomorrow. It's interesting. And they got it done in three years, so that's outstanding. Yeah, I mean, now now a lot of their uh, large um, uh, commercial vehicles are still carbon based, but the the, uh, uh, consumer vehicles have all switched over now, which is pretty cool. So, Clint. Say a little bit, just uh, real quick, about what you're working on right now. Your name is Clinton or Clint? Clint, yes. Like Eastwood. Oh, Uh, yeah. (laughs) There you go. Fistful of Dollars. I'm going to call you Fistful of Dollars now. All right. Say, I'm going to introduce you as Fistful of Dollars from now. I'll I'll go with that. I'll allow it. So, yeah, that was my dad's favorite actor, so he named me uh, after him. Cool. And I'm working on publishing for some service professionals and some of my own products, and found a couple of interesting things we can talk about during the show and tell portion so oh cool awesome so well, um, just introduce yourself and say kind of what you're working on yes, quickly I'm working in a world. what's your name my name is claudia spell it please claudia c-l-a-d-e-a okay <laughs> uh well uh presently I'm working in two projects. First of all, to finish my book and to publish it. Cool. And uh, I was last time, and uh, but the finish, and I couldn't uh, obtain all the information for that reason. <laughs> I took uh, <laughs> this time today. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit with my English uh, outside <laughs> uh, because uh, I. I'm here from five months and uh, I'm coming from Canada, French area. Mm. And the second project is that I will open here a foundation and I want to take more information, knowledge about uh, how I can publish, uh, I can organize my marketing and publishing Mm -hmm. uh, concerning this foundation uh, in which I want to work. Because... uh, I'm working also in energy and I want to open a foundation in holistic uh, clinical uh, treatments. And I want to, well, um, I have my marketing plan, but uh, maybe I can uh, obtain more tools and knowledge um, to promote this foundation. Cool, and I'll, I'll publish these up. We were um, we were just talking a minute ago. Uh, I was talking with Katya about um, some of the ways, um, and I'll have to go back and read chapter fifty-five of my book and make sure I've got everything in there because I spoke for I spoke at two mastermind groups over the weekend for a total of about three hours, and we just went really deep into um, different ways of promoting books that are way different than most people do. And these guys, I mean, some of these guys are making millions of dollars a month and they're like writing as fast as I'm speaking. And they're, and I've already got, there's, we've already created this community that's uh, working on some of these cross promoting ideas. And so there's some, I, I'm imagining there's going to be some additional interesting content that I'll publish about that and I'll announce it on the group when I get that done. I'm not a very, very technology specialized, okay, and for that reason I want to learn more. Uh, even if I teach online, I have not all the tools in technology to, to uh, can manage uh, quickly all these tools. For that reason I'm here to, to see what I can, uh, how I can improve my uh, 
this problem? <laughs> Well, you know the two the two primary tools that if you if you mastered only these two tools, you could probably knock it out of the ballpark. In fact, I know a lot of people that have completely changed their marketing to follow the kind of the template I'm using. Is if you if all you do is master Kindle publishing and Meetup and nothing else, then you don't really require anything else. Everything else to me is just an additional, you know, speeding things up or um, uh, additional ways to attract people, but they're, they're, those are the two core technologies. Because what Amazon and Meetup really do is they, they divide these huge numbers of people into these small uh, segments of marketplaces. So if you go and, you, for example, you go to an internet marketing, you know, like, uh, what's one of the, like traffic and conversion or one of the big internet marketing um, uh, summits they have, the whole focus is on attracting traffic and then segmenting the traffic, meaning that you take all the people that come and you segment them into all their interests and then you take those segments and, and funnel it down smaller and smaller until the idea is you get these few people out the end that are really interested in being your clients. Those are your real clients. Well, with Meetup and Amazon, you just throw away all this and you get these people with no work mm -hmm. because they've already done the work. So th those are the two, especially if you have technological challenges, those, those would be the places that I suggest to focus. Yeah. Awesome. So Octavia. That was like an incredibly perfect segue from the RISE session I just came out of, which was... Oh yeah, how was RISE today? Um, I, I've attended some really awesome sessions this week. Cool. Yeah, I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm on fire. Um, <laughs> the one I went to this morning, um, gave me a piece of marketing related to you know, how do I start? How do I find my market? So I'd love to kind of like put your knowledge in that. Um, and um, so I'm Octavia Brooks. I have an online temple, templewithoutboundaries.com, and I am. Um, I've got my site up. I've got some products on there. I've got a, a philosophy and a business plan. And what I really need to do is find my customers, build my tribe. Um, test out my hypotheses of who my customers are mm -hmm. and refine my product, refine my messaging and all that around a good segment. So what they were recommending is, you know, basically hustle. You know, I, I think I could have a couple of meetup groups with a couple of different ideas and survey people, vet some ideas with people, have well, what was their groups. What was their suggestion on the mechanics of how to, to they do that? They stayed more strategic because it was a smaller and a half long, and that was only one part of their presentation. Um, it's uh, lean, the Lean Entrepreneur guys, yeah. um, Patrick, lean startup, Vess yeah. Glovitz, and Brent Cooper. Haven't met him. Um, What's the name of this one? <clears throat> no, it's this Rise. This was the Rise session I went to this okay. morning. Um, they're flying consultants in from all over the country to give these free classes to entrepreneurs mm -hmm. this week. It ends today. Um, but but yeah, their their basic tenet was don't don't try to fish with every available mechanism in the ocean of you know. But come up with some hypotheses about who you think your customers are. Test those hypotheses. Really figure out who your customers are. Talk to them. Serve them. Like physically get in front of physical people. Mm -hmm interview, talk, find out their language, what their problems are, and then start working that particular market, figure out how your product solves their problem or how you can solve their problem with a new product or that type of thing. And then really get work that niche. Work it, work it, work it till you got money coming in the door and then right. you can vary off of that niche or find another niche. So does Amazon do that for you? Well, Meetup's much better than that. because, And this was a conversation I had uh, with the first mastermind talk that I gave last week, which was to people that, I mean, these guys are paying a lot of money to be in the room. And I know the guy running the mastermind, he said, you know, come, he's starting to use the Meetup technology I talk about. And he's like, dude, you just got to come and tell these guys because it'll, you know, it's good stuff. It's some some uh, uber secret sauce. But I still need to read, read, read and reread those chapters. Well, so, so here's the simple way you do it. And so here's the question I posed to this group because they're all, you know, like some of these guys. I know one guy there that's um, his Facebook ad buy budget every month is between 50 to 100 grand per client. And he's got a bunch of them. That's a lot of money. And so my question to him was, okay, so you get, you know, 
but uh, uh, it, it, you get all these people. I said, and so would you rather have a hundred thousand people that you got from Facebook ads, or two hundred people in a room in front of you that you knew were interested in your topic? He said, freaking two hundred people any day. It's worth yeah, that's worth you know potentially millions of dollars over a, the entire lifetime of a customer. So my question was, well, why are you wasting all this time and money doing these stupid Facebook ads? I mean, it's not I shouldn't say stupid. That's a judgment, but it's a different way to go. So you have to go, to go normal, the normal way that you would probably find most people in Rise talking about would be. Oh, is somebody knocking? Oh, it must be somebody new. Um, Come on in. Okay, so uh, just to, to um, uh, finish up uh, a little bit of talking about uh, the master ground group that I was speaking with is that the conversation, oh, we'll wait, we'll let, uh, wait till Lacey gets back here. All right, so um, just to wrap up on our conversation, so the, the conversation I was having with these guys in this mastermind that we're spending, you know, like uh, one guy was uh, doing ad buys of uh, 5,200 grand per client per month for Facebook ads. Another guy was, uh, everybody know who J.T. Fox is? Yeah. J.T. Fox, he runs a speaking circuit. This, uh, one of the guys in the room was uh, doing, uh, filling rooms for J.T. Fox, and he said it took him about 35 to 50 grand to put 200 people in a room. And I'm like, good Lord, guy. And, and it took, took a lot of work, too, right, just to get these people. And so with Meetup, it's completely different because you go into Meetup, you form a group and you pick 15 categories that match whatever it is you're doing. And also if you, um, I, I choose to even know how I'd explain how I do the research on Meetup because it's so bizarre. Um, and I've done it for so long that it just kind of is second nature. So I've got to figure out how to explain how to do that. Well, one of the things you want to look for is the tags have a high number of people associated with you. Don't, don't well, yeah, them. but there's no way to find those unless okay. you just know that. No, there's not. Mm -hmm. Th none of those links are public anymore. They're gone. Oh, they took them out? Like yeah. When I set up my meetup last fall, I was able to find the one. Oh, yeah, but that no, no longer exists anymore. Oh, that sucks. So, yeah. yeah, it used to be that you could go and you could easily figure out, okay, I got 15 categories, and if there's a thousand people waiting on each category, that's simple math, then 15 times a thousand is 15,000 people will find out about my meetup group when it announces. But they stopped publishing all those links, and they also stopped publishing the interface to it where you could actually do the analysis. So the links, if you know how to manually type the links in, which is in, I think, chapter 32 of Beautiful Business, which is worth its weight in gold, um, just to know what the link structure is to get to them. Um, if you can figure out what those 15 categories are, for example, um, I, and this was the next question I posed to these guys, when I set up this book design mastermind, I set it up so that the email went out to, um, I think, 55,000 people, and it announced like after we'd run the first one. So normally I'll capture like 100 or 200 people and it only captured like 30 people because it, it the, timing, yeah. the timing was off. Um, anyway, the, the, the point of all this is is that you can spend a lot of money and a lot of time and try to figure out a lot of technology like you were talking about technology. And if you go to all these big conferences, they'll try to you know, bamboozle you with technical jargon and, you know, like uh, you got to have this software and do this thing and you got to know how to do Facebook and Twitter. Oh, don't, don't, I don't do any of that stuff. It just makes my head spin. Just, you know, figure out how to use Kindle and Meetup. Those are the only two things. And once you know how, and once you've mastered them, then you can go to things like your own website. And if you can somehow figure out some useful way to use Facebook and Twitter, I have yet to figure it out. So when you get you do your meetup announcement, and I know you keep the meetup going for two or three months, and then you slough off all this. Be qualified. Yeah, I'll move. You I'll transition, transition those people to my main group, and then close that. However, one of the things that I found this time is that because my meetup SEO magic of the things I go through to get uh, the initial meetup groups ranked really high in Google, um, it's like first page of Google for Book Design Mastermind is you know, I almost said polluted, is filled with links for that new meetup group I started. So I'll work a little bit on that uh, term and if I find that's something, book design mastermind is a real term I'd like to go after for a long period of time, I'll just leave that group up. Because it only costs, you know, 
144 bucks a year for three groups and if you know if uh, I'll just open another account and just transfer to that that account and just leave it running so it just you know so I, I typically if I've got a group that's uh, that's going to be dormant that I'm going to rarely work with I'll transition it to another account it's been a while since I've gone through all that hoopla but there's no way to get more groups and meet up a lot of people have you know, suggested as an enhancement to Meetup that they sell packages of like, you know, raise the monthly rate and give people 10 groups a month or something. So there, is there any particular wisdom, because I'm right at this juncture of about to set up specific Meetups, mm -hmm. any particular wisdom about like the, the content of the first couple of Meetups? Or like well, so um, in setting up, in initially setting up Meetup groups, um, used to be that all the people that worked at meetup.com were actual meetup organizers right, right, right. so it was really it behooved you it was in your best interest to actually <coughs> write a very detailed group description and a few physical events that were very detailed because these guys were organizers and they would go through and they could figure out if is this person really actually running meetups or are they just scamming meetup to get clients like I'm talking about last time, yeah. and so um, the last time I did that though or the last few times that they've just gotten rejected and I, I realized that meetup has grown so fast that they probably got some minimum wage employees employees doing this now and they ain't got a clue and so the more you say now it's probably to your detriment so I just like when I uh, formed this uh, the book design mastermind I the name of the, the group the whole group uh, description was book design mastermind period space title says it all period that was it for the the and then the for the um, oh could you let them in Lacey thank you and then for the events the same thing Book Design Mastermind, title says it all, period. And it was accepted in 18 hours. And the other one I, I uh, set up, it took like 10 days and they rejected it. So that's the that's the uh, the uh, trick there. Howdy. Less, less is more there. So yeah, so less is more. But as far as like people signing up for the meetup and okay. signing up to come to the actual meetup set, well, and with the meetup sessions, you're you know RSVP if you're interested. I, I get you don't have to actually have physical presence here. Um, but how do you woo? the people to join your group and come oh that that really has to do with the meetup group description and first events so what you have to do is you have to watch your meetup email and this is the, I learned this this last time too so I set up the group description as book design mastermind and the first event book design mastermind and the meetup troll or I mean person reviewing the group said okay I can understand that approved and then I got an email that said, your group's been approved, except the announcement hadn't gone out yet. And I thought, well, I wonder if I just go in and put all the stuff back in that they rejected. They probably, that raises no flags, they'll probably send that out, and they did. So now there's the window of you have to set your group up to where it'll be approved, and then once you get the stamp of approval, then immediately you track that email, like go and check it every few hours, and as soon as you get that email, then you go in and put your your long group description of what your group really is and set up all your events. And then that group description is what gets emailed to all the people waiting on your topics. And that uh, for me that was about a two or three day period, something like that. So you've got you've got some time. It's just that you know, as their systems um, improve, that window of time may collapse down to a, a short period. Yep. So that might uh, that might help you help assist out. Oh, who's here? Okay. Anything else, Octavia? Um, no, I think I just I need to do a lot of thinking about how um, how I want to collect information from people in a way that's a value add for them. No, oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Is that kind of like catch 20? Well, and also about your questions that you add groups, I would leave all those off until you get the stamp of approval because if you ask the wrong kind of question, I'm guessing that the troll has to go through and figure out so they get some kind of report that says all the things that a person has changed from the defaults. This is my guess anyway. So maybe they review questions, maybe not. I would just skip that and when you go back and change your group description, yeah. then go put your questions in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Oh, right, right. I can yeah, so, so do as little information as possible so you avoid any confusion of <laughs> people that are non-meetup organizers. Yeah. And I forgot about the, the questions to join the group. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Cool. And so introduce yourself and just quickly say what you're working on right now. Uh, I'm Graydon Trussler and we met at the Mastermind last, uh, yeah. last week actually. Mm -hmm. and um, my wife is a divorce lawyer in town and has a, uh, we've had a, she's had a book that she wrote and she's about 90% through and I just hadn't, we just hadn't done anything with it. So after I spoke to you and you mentioned you had this, I'm going to come here and just knock this thing out. This is my get it done. beautiful wife. Hi. 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 She'll be doing the rest of this group. <laughs> yeah, no, I I'll leave this one to <laughs> Yeah, so, so I've, I've got the, the book done, and, and it's really we're going to use it as, as a lead gen for her mm -hmm. you know, divorce practice here in town. So. Well, the thing about Kindle, too, is if you got 90% of a book, I published my book, uh, my first book is up to like 40,000 words, but I published it when I had like eight or 9,000, the first edition. So if you're 90% done, that means that that 90% done should be edition one exactly. published on Amazon <laughs> exactly. before the sun goes down today. Yeah, and, and, right? yeah, and that's what I, th I thought. If I, if I just focus, I can knock this thing out you know, the weekend or something. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Do you put in a, a thing that will update all the people who bought the book there's a way, and I don't know how to do it, but on Amazon there's a way to well. send it so they get updated. <laughs> there's not. Well, you have to, that's, um, I've actually, it's so complicated that I had, there's, there's a 15 minute video up on my video channel that explains how to do that because it is, it, I had, I had open trouble tickets with Amazon for two months and I probably talked to over 20 people by phone, chat, email. And everybody said, "Oh, it's a bug in our system." And then I found out, no, it's not a bug in their system. You, there's this wet, there's this procedure you have to go through. So just because you publish an edition update uh -huh. to change typos or add content, that in no way means that that will ever get to the people who have bought uh, your previous I books. I recently got one, a, a book I bought where it was updated. So right, but they went through this process, so they, you'll just have to go and yeah, so just go through and tell watch me your, the video. Your, how do I get? Oh, it's uh, InsideTrackParty.com/videos. Inside track party. party. Yeah, the Com name of this. I know you have a thousand okay. videos out there. Like, can, what's the couple keywords about this one? How to publish updates? Uh, if you go there, I've got it all arranged in playlists now. So if you look at the one that's about Kindle publishing, okay. you can find it in there. You'll find the the um, recordings from last um, one of these too. So. Yeah, I'm Lee Jackson. I apologize for being late. Howdy, Lee. <laughs> Good Southern name. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm just back from Afghanistan. I've been over oh, Iraq for 18 months in Afghanistan for. Okay. Thanks for your service. 19 yeah. each. And thank you. And um, so my job over there was a little unusual. It was to get out in the population, find out what they're thinking, bring it back to the command, and make recommendations on how to meet um, military objectives uh, using non lethal means. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's a part of the war that very few people know about. I used to write an email. Um, it was just, it went out to my wife and it went to my kids and it went to my classmates and ended up circulating the Pentagon finally. And uh, so I've been kind of pushed to put the, compile this stuff into a book and, cool. and uh, publish it. So that's one thing I'm working on. And then the other is uh, um, a, a novel I wrote years ago. It won an award and then the market for it went away. It was when the Berlin Wall fell. And uh, so I think now, uh, on a self-published basis, cool. I think I can get it back out. You betcha. Yeah. Awesome. So, Katya, we already talked a little bit about you, but just uh, just do a quick wrap up of what yeah, you Yeah, I, I spoke words before most people were here. Mm -hmm. My name is Katya Walter. Uh, I have four books in print on uh, Amazon and four books in. Uh, E for ebooks from Kindle, and I've also got those books in uh, iTunes Bookstore, which you're telling me to take out, and I've been thinking about that. Oh yeah, so everybody keep in mind that if you publish multiple places and Amazon figures it out, they'll reduce your commission they're paying from 70 to 30 percent. And Amazon has something like 80 percent of the total market yeah. now, so better to take the 70 percent from <laughs> Amazon than sell one or two books occasionally on in iBooks and you know drop your your commission rate. My problem is it's so much easier to get on the iTunes bookstore for me using InDesign. I have not yet been able to get the contents, uh, the content links right. 
on uh, the Amazon books. Well, that's that's another conversation that we'll we'll maybe have today yeah, or another time. Yeah, I'm just throwing it out. Yeah. right now. So and the reason for that is that um, when you're publish, uh, publishing on Kindle, the best way to publish is using KF8, which is the their HTML and CSS. If you use .doc, .docx, or PDF, or Mobi, or EPUB, the likelihood of your book actually looking like you expect is exactly zero. Oh, my book looks very good, except I can't get the links in right on the table of contents so that it goes to the chapters. Everything else looks really good. Well, the way the way that you do, and are you publishing it is in a, a, what type of format? What's the what's the physical? InDesign is a part of. No, that's not. That doesn't. But that doesn't tell me what you export it at. What's oh, the extension? It. Okay, I I am exporting it as PDF. Okay, so don't do that okay. ever. <laughs> you have to export it as an HTML. So uh, what's it called on Doc? It's it's called a, what do they call that? A strip or what? yeah, you can do a web page filter. Okay, so uh, there's probably something in InDesign. Um, yeah, I think you can publish it as HTML. But yeah, so seen. what you have to do, though, is then you have to take that HTML file and you have to run it through the W3C validator, which is W3, or which is validator.w3c.org, I think. Yeah. That has to give you zero errors or good luck with your book ever looking. It's, it's going to be somehow broken in Amazon. So that's the that's an absolute rule is you only upload stuff that's syntactically correct to Amazon because the you know the ingester won't have any clue what to do with it if it's got syntax errors. What's the what was that syntax? It's validator.w3.org. Look at that little wolf up there. Yeah. She has got her she's got her perch. Yeah, and the same way with your web pages, um, and the same way with the, if you're running a WordPress site or whatever. Only use a theme that has, um, you know, passes validation. That's the source of most people's SEO woes, and all sorts of woes is that their theme is just spewing out HTML errors, and people's browsers go, "Huh, eh? what?" Or the Google spider comes by to index a page, and it reads along, and it hits a syntax error, and goes, "Huh," eh? and starts throwing stuff out until it can try to figure out where it is, and if the most important Content that you're meaning it for at the index is stuff that it threw out trying to figure out how to get to a non error place to restart, then it's lost. So, really important, everybody ought to do that is only publish uh, content anywhere that's syntactically correct. How do you know how to do that? Validator.w3.org. You go and check it. Hmm. Yeah. It's amazing how many uh, people, that, to me anyway, that publish uh, on the internet without checking. It would be like um, Nobody does that anymore. Pardon me? Nobody thinks to do that anymore because it's all like it's behind the scenes for most of us. Well, but what you do with WordPress is you check your 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 syntax once, and if you have valid syntax, then you know it's valid all over your site. If it's broken on one page, then you know it's broken on every page. Yeah. But you know, I've run it through um, the thing that you have to run it through to get it on uh, iTunes, and you can't get it through iTunes unless it's really clean. Well, but again, iTunes, you should never, do, forget iTunes. Don't use that. They'll only use iTunes for audio content. Never put written content, in, unless that's the only place you're doing it, which you'll separate yourself from huge amounts of money. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, uh, yeah so. I, 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 that's why I'm asking these questions. I want to learn how to do it better. But the validator is the, that's the, the validator is your friend. Yep. I use that tool multiple times a day, usually with clients and myself. So, and it's free. Just go out and use it. Cool. Anybody got any show and tell? Fistful of dollars? Yeah. <laughs> I got a couple. There was a... I knew you said you had some. Interesting. You were talking about the iBook store and everything. So I was looking at a Smashwords survey mm -hmm. this morning. And Smashwords... Wait, wait, wait. Tell don't... people what Smashwords yeah, is. Yeah. Smashwords, if you don't know, is a publishing platform, I think you, they make it easy. You pretty much upload a Word document or a PDF and their software will crunch it into the formats where it can go out to iBooks and Barnes and & Noble and I think Amazon and many other places that again are all small players. Which if you go if you go into share. Amazon and search for Smashwords too, they've got a bunch of free Kindle books that are very uh, useful to read. Just skip the part where they say to use their platform. Right. Just read it and use it for yourself. 
<laughs> yeah, and I downloaded a couple. They've had some of their numbers and their marketing platforms to use, so I'm going to see what they have to say based on all their data because they've got some good over 250,000 different titles, so they've got a whole lot of data mm -hmm. since they've got that many titles even on some of these smaller player platforms. It's still an aggregate, a lot of data that can be useful. And one of the things they found was in 2012, the 99 cent price point was pretty big, and then like 299, 399, and they found that the uh, 299 and 399 would sell as many copies or a little bit more than the 99 cent. And all of those sold about four times more than their baseline, which was 999. So they said 999 sells at a, a certain amount. If you price at 99 cents or 299 or 399, you sell roughly four times the amount of copies you would sell at $10. And, and uh, let, let me just a quick question. So does the is the pulsing mechanism, does that still work? Because I haven't done a pulse yet on my book. And I'll explain what that is in a minute. So I'm just uh, curious. Yeah, you know. the way Johnny described it on that call, it does. It does. He's one of the experts in perfect publishing, if you don't know that. Yeah, so, so pulsing just means that inside the Amazon system, you can temporarily lower the... Thank you, Lacey. You can lower the price point of your book, and Amazon will give that more pro promo promotional bandwidth, supposedly inside Amazon. In other words, they'll supposedly promote your book. Yeah. And I choose to know if it really works that well anymore. I don't anyway. think the internal Amazon engine does too much additional promotion. Anymore. Maybe if you drop from a nine ninety nine down to ninety nine cents, you might get lucky and go out in Amazon's email blast. Hey, this, oh, yeah. these books were just reduced or mm -hmm. you know super discount. They do a couple. Amazon does a couple different emails. I think they do a ninety nine cent, uh, two ninety nine, and an under three ninety nine. So they do like three different variations to their emails they send out. So you might get in that, but that's definitely hit or miss. Yeah. Um, and so the Smashwords survey, they found that 299 or 399 were some of the best price points because you get four times the sales that you would at 10 bucks, but they're still a, Well, you're also in the 70% yeah. commission realm too. You get the higher cash in your pocket as the author, yeah. and you also get people that actually read your book because a lot of problems with free book giveaways or 99 cent giveaways, it's not enough of a motivation someone's only paid that small amount where they actually go through and read your book. So it's a real good balance of people actually reading your book, maybe becoming a fan and putting more dollars in your yeah, book. Yeah, and keep in mind that Amazon has uh, stopped um, really even surfacing free books very well anymore. Yeah, they've put that hidden. So if you're gonna do what David talked about, a pulse, which is basically a promotion where you're going free or 99 cents, you've gotta get in some, there's a list of book deal sites that are specifically uh, they attract visitors and readers that are looking for deals on Kindle books so they'll publish out to their followers hey these books are free today or mm -hmm. these books have been reduced to 99 cents so yeah so that, the, you've these are really get outside promotion to really get your promotion in yeah these are really the, the, this is a really complicated um, uh, topic and if you're really interested in in like becoming a Kindle publishing ninja and knowing all the guts of the, the Amazon engine, then uh, if you look at davidfavor.com slash PPS, there's a link to Johnny's course. Yeah. Uh, at least it works the last time I checked. Uh, that they're doing away with it because they're making so much money publishing books that they don't want to waste their time answering questions about their product. So if you're interested in getting it, I suspect it'll disappear soon. Opposite of a lot of other trainers that yeah. most of their money training. Yeah, these guys are making their money actually writing books and publishing them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, three other uh, simple things that they, they found from all their data is longer books tend to sell better, but the caveat is don't just make your book longer with filler that's uninteresting or doesn't add to the book. If your story needs to be told in 50,000 words, don't just add in 100,000 just to get to that, right. that level. Uh, but in general, longer books sell better. Um, have a book cover that promises a desired outcome. That's a huge uh, thing, especially with nonfiction, but even with uh, even fiction, fiction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, enticing book cover with the image and the title. And for your description on your book sales page, about 150 to 200 words is the prime level. A lot of books that had just a super short description mm -hmm. yeah. sold like crap, and a lot of books that had super long description. So Can I ask a question important. on that real quick? You mentioned the nonfiction versus the fiction. Yeah. A lot of times it seems to me like when I hear people talking about nonfiction these days, what they're talking about is how-to books. 
And self-help, that's nonfiction. Okay, well, as opposed to... Well, it could be biographies. About, which is, you know, compiling what I did over it, that's nonfiction, but it's not a how-to. I'm not going to Right, you're telling, well, but you could you're turn telling it into a story based. <laughs> you're telling a story based on true events. Well, but what he's so you could take your information. You could also go back, and I thought somebody ought to do this: is go back and uh, de uh, decompose the whole Marshall Plan, how that ran back after World War II, because it was extremely the most effective reconstruction plan ever done in history, and there's a reason for that. And it, you know, all, the, all these guys in government now doing all these random studies, they ought to just go back and look and see how the Marshall Plan worked and just model the darn. Thing. But anyway, I, I better not get on my soapbox. <laughs> but if you took what you found working with the populace in Afghanistan, took what Marshall, what the Marshall Plan did, both successes and failures, and you turn that into a combination of, you know, here's the background, like here's what I found when I was in Afghanistan, here's what the Marshall Plan, you know, people found when they were working it, and if I was going to redo this part today, here's the the step by step of what I would do with the populace in Afghanistan and Iraq and you know, before long, or maybe other places. I don't know. Yeah. We better not go down that. Yeah. So anyway, but you know, you could turn it into a combination of like um, uh, a, a historical or biographical. You could even interview. There's probably, well, I don't know. There's probably not too many people left alive that worked on the Marshall Plan, uh, but maybe. Yeah. Um, and there's probably other people you could interview that are working in your specific um, realm. Yeah, if you could make that toward the final chapters like David's talking about a checklist that would apply to business based on these findings. Well, what I'd probably do if I were going to do that is do two books. One is get this one out that I'm talking about right now because it's... it's yeah, like a backgrounder. Yeah, and then uh, coming back later. But what? how does that stack up against... Uh, forget the, the subject for the uh, the moment, but a uh, similar thing. You're basically talking about nonfiction, but it's not yeah. how-to. Well, you know that story about the, I forgot the exact title, but the story that came out about the SEAL Team 6 uh, thing that yeah. sold really oh, well. Oh, Zero Dark Thirty, that yeah. sort of thing. Uh, that was a movie. That was the there movie, was a but book, the book guy wrote out, it. Yeah. It was a number one bestseller for quite a while. Yeah, he it sold a lot of copies. Yeah. There have been a few of the books yeah, about got, the Afghanistan yeah. war. So yeah, he got in trouble. The point being, there's built-in readers that are interested in the Afghanistan war if you're publishing that type of nonfiction. Yeah. yeah. And you can probably get media coverage, too, because you've got a really unique angle on it and a hidden part of the war that a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, and in your particular case, um, what I would suggest too is that you um, go register on speak speakermatch.com mm -hmm. and you can do radio interviews about it too. Uh, that seems like a, a ready topic for like talk radio. Especially, I mean, I almost yeah, said the, matter of fact, the, cr the crazies, but yeah, I mean, there's some, there's some, there's some really crazy segments that yeah. listen to some. We won't mention any names, but there's some, some specific pundits that um, attract huge followings of ultra conservative people that are rabid um, uh, consumers of audio content, interview <coughs> content, and you know, you could probably realistically get on, you know, several. Uh, hours a week uh, through speaker match and, and um, I suggest speaker match because it's like you know what it's like 20 bucks a month or something I'm gonna join too because I was looking at it's like it's so darn cheap I'm gonna join it for a year and and see what the numbers are at the end because RTIR which um, I don't have a copy of right now RTIR is the the um, the magazine that uh, prints for uh, radio hosts to read, but they charge like uh, for half of a col one column on a page is like fifteen hundred bucks an issue or something, and that's only if you buy like four or five sh uh, months in a row or issues in a row. Yeah. So I would say speaker match is a probably a much better buy, and also um, you know you might look around and see. Um, you might look for, uh, you know, like tea party groups, or I don't know exactly what the demographic would be, but there's probably meetup groups you could search for that would be interested to have you as a speaker too. Well, talk radio too. Better yeah, the, well, talk radio. That speaker match will pick up talk radio. Yeah. Blog, blog talk radio. Oh, blog talk radio. Yeah, you could search around on blog talk radio. radio. Um, if blog talk's free, but you could either get on somebody's show who mm -hmm. has a lot of a big following in your sector. Or start your own too, potentially. Yeah, and the easy way to figure that out is you can just, um, you know, Google your particular, you know, keywords that work with your um, a particular audience, and then put, say, site s uh, s i t e colon blogtalkradio dot com. Mm -hmm. So that searches only blogtalkradio for those topics, and that'll give you back the largest. Uh, 
um, you know, the largest uh, radio shows that have the best traction. Okay. That's a really good uh, technique to use is if you're looking for something like you'd like to, to um, uh, limit the search to Meetup or Blog Talk Radio or YouTube, whatever, you can use that site colon syntax. So. That's something that I'm really interested in is I've always wanted to be on the Speakers Bureau circuit. Mm -hmm. I haven't actually researched it yet, but um, I am a good teacher and I love explaining things to people. I've always wanted to be on the radio and talking to people. So this speakermatch.com is a great thing. Yeah, so it's speaker match and then... Um, uh, See, there's else? another one that I've heard. Of. Well, there's all sorts of different speaker bureaus, uh, but they're, I mean, like the NSA speaker, the National Speakers Association. I don't know. what. Do you know what the dues are for that, Octavia? Oh, it's, it's yeah, oh, like fifteen grand or something. Yeah, it's like it's really expensive. It's big names. So it's you know, and just for people who are just starting out, I think it's mm, like yeah. two fifty a year. It's really reasonable, and they coach you. They came and spoke at the Holistic Chamber, and yeah, um, they've been running at Speaker Match for like it's almost up to fifteen years now. They've been running it here in town. Yeah, they'll help you come up with your package of you know your little promo package and what looks good and what works and what sells and stuff like that. I'm interested in that too. I do a lot of talks around Austin, but I want to do something bigger. I'm ready to start doing that. Well, and bigger may not be better. It, a better way of saying is to figure out what your in well, target is. Like if your in target is like money in pocket, then bigger, you know, I've spoken to large audiences and it's netted me exactly zero. And I've, mm -hmm. spent, I've talked to small audiences and um, it's been much more lucrative. Mm -hmm. So you have to figure out what your your desired outcome is and then you can backtrack from there to figure out where the best place is. Mm -hmm. um, but speaker match is definitely, okay. um, I think, is a, a good place to start. The other thing is, um, I choose to remember what the chapter is in Beautiful Business that I wrote about how to um, do searches in your local area for um, uh, conferences and large groups of people that are getting together mm -hmm. and how to then take that data and figure out where to put your speaker proposal in okay. and you could probably I mean I was looking at this here recently and I you know when my time frees up I figure I could probably speak every day here in Austin if I if I really desired to right. Right. and you know that's uh, the difference between driving down the street 10 minutes or taking a plane flight someplace so I recommend you just uh, stay in your local area until you've got some, you know, uh, large cash reserves to play with for travel. Okay. The other side I was thinking of was help a reporter. Help a reporter. You know, I, I know that that's... that's so help a... Yeah, so Hel Haro is... Um, that's a, um, a conception of... Um, oh, what's the two brothers that run RTIR... Clint um, Harrison. Oh yeah, Harrison Steve brother. Harrison and uh, yeah. So so they created Haro with the idea that it would replace RTIR, but Haro just bites rocks. H A R R O. Haro help a reporter out dot com is the name of it. But what what the idea is is kind of like a free speaker match. The problem is that I I probably invested two or three months of my time. And what you get is you say, okay, I'm a, an expert about these topics. Mm -hmm. And then you start getting email about those topics. Problem is, the email you get are basically people trying to do uh, roundabout ways to figure out who you are so they can pitch you their stuff. Oh, and nice. And mm -hmm. so yeah, it's basically like you're, you're asking telemarketers to call you when you yeah, participate in the system. And I complained to them. I said, you know, I don't know, mm -hmm. I don't know how you fix this, but I'm yeah. out. And most everybody I know is that has that had that same experience as it hasn't really uh, created any large income. Same way with RTIR, I know Tim Levy um, did a six or seven month cycle, which is probably about they put out about an issue every two weeks or twice a month. So that was uh, what 12, 13, 14 issues. And he said the majority of calls he got were people trying to pitch him stuff instead of actually bookings for speaking yeah. engagements. So I think in general, speaker match is probably a better way to do it. And then also, everybody know how the conferences work. Like if you'd like to speak someplace, um, just go through my book in that section that talks about how to find places. And then you go to the speaker proposal form, and you can just input your speaker proposal. And a lot of places, um, uh, that's you know all that's required. 
some places like Affiliate Summit and PubCon now, what they do is they take all the speaker proposals and they put it to the community for a vote. Yeah, and the community then votes. Uh, or if you happen to know the the, um, the guy running the conference, then sometimes you can, um, like I, I spoke at uh, Affiliate Summit uh, here when it was in Austin last time, and the, the topic I chose, I put in my speaker proposal and I didn't hear anything back for like six weeks. and I. I called Sean, the guy, he's a friend of mine that runs it, and I said, uh, well, you know, what, I, the first time I'd ever put in a speaker, pro, so what's the procedure? And he said, oh, yeah, I remember your thing. The The steering committee read over your proposal, and it was so interesting, we just rubber stamped you because we wanted to come. Mm -hmm. Right, so, you know. I'll tell you about it. And they just, uh, and I didn't even know, I was, they said, yeah, I'll make sure I have somebody, you know, since it went outside channels to make sure you get your information about when to show up when your talk is. Anyway, so, and that's another thing that I talk about is if you can find people like Brett Tapke runs PubCon, he lives here in town, Sean Collins runs Affiliate Summit, Affiliate Summit has four to 5,000 people at each one that pays between a grand and two grand a pop to be there. That is a good audience. Yeah. WordCamp is another good one. Like your, your stuff might work with WordCamp. You'd have okay. to go to Word, WordCamp.tv and figure out some way to... You know, you have to do kind of the TED Talk approach where you have to take electrical power and make it, you know, relatable to, like, websites, for example. Mm -hmm. And, you know, roll it up into a 10 or 15 minute really fast-paced, um, right. fun presentation that you could probably get into WordCamp. So, yeah, Octavia. Um, I'm, I have a lot of, like, tips and tricks that I've learned over this week, if you want, you know. To from, uh, from Rise? From all the different, yeah, presentations. Oh, cool. Um, it, it, would it take a long time to go over those, or? Um, I could I could do a couple. Where you got a highlight reel? Yeah. So um, help we're on help a reporter out. But if you want to send press releases, um, the way you can get targeted lists of contact people is Mondo Times. And there's a huge database. You pay maybe twenty bucks or so, and then you get your your targeted list of editors at the right places that you really want to tell Mondo people. Mondo Times. And that's print. Mondo Times. That's a uh, print database. It's, um, I believe. Well, I believe it's mostly print. Yeah. Cool. Um, but yeah, you, that's so p press releases are good if you can target them properly, and especially if you work those relationships. Um, one of the key tips I learned was like the intersection of social. H and hang on just a second. Yeah. Could 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 we pause the the? Uh, yeah. it was my wife and uh, she was sick this morning, so oh, I'm just okay. double checking. Yeah. Go, sure go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the there's a. People in our position need to keep in mind of the intersection between social media and SEO and realize that social media, everybody thinks you need to do it, but nobody's really getting any sales whatsoever from that. I know there's a lot of activity there's and there ain't activity no sales. And there's like brand I don't know recognition what SEO and all is. that type. Search engine optimization okay. is the keyword. Um, Having your content found in search engines. Um, yeah. What you find is that there are SEO experts and there are social media experts and near the twin shall meet. So as entrepreneurs, we definitely need to be aware that um, you have to put those two together and find, and there aren't very many qualified people that know how to put them together. And Google Plus is probably the intersection of those two things mm -hmm. and something we all need to know a lot more about. It's, it's probably the future yeah, of Facebook really. because Facebook, Facebook's usage is going down, uh, it went down like 4% last year. Yeah, month. people are abandoning um, Facebook. They're jumping ship and Google is the fresh hot new platform, it's clean. And Google's requiring people to create profiles to use anything related to Google, which is everything. Google doesn't play very well with the other social media arenas. However, if you have a Google platform, a, a Google profile, and you connect it to all your stuff, and you talk about all the forums and groups and websites and everything you contribute to, you develop this authorship rating. Yeah. Which then, um, when somebody types in your name or anything related to you, your name and picture come up on the right, right. not ads. You come up, so there's this um, authorship tag that we also need to put into our website. Or I don't know much about author. Yeah, if you look at um, if you go to davidfavor.com, my kind of website where I've got my projects listed, and you hit view source, so you can look at the HTML that it has the syntax there, and a lot of times my picture will come up in searches now. How many websites do you have? Me? Yeah. Uh, the 
uh, less than 200 domains right now. Less than 200. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, I've been I've been pruning them. It's called authorship. Yeah. 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 So Google, Google Plus basically is a, a mechanism where you can basically prove to Google that you are a real person, and then uh, wherever you publish, like if Lacey was going to go on your blog, for example, like if you restarted your blog, then you would set it up where you verified that you, Lacey Van and Bosch, are the owner of this site and you verify with Google that you're a real person and then um, you every one of your articles that you publish under your name like on your site you might publish under different names There's a lot of people do that but under your name then that all that content would be attributed to you as the author what else that does is if somebody comes and steals your content Google will treat whoever publishes first wins yeah. whoever published and that's really important so that's another thing when you're publishing on Kindle, never, 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 ever, ever leave that content any place where anybody can get to it in the same form you upload to Kindle. That means search engines, um, you don't send a preview copy to somebody to review because if they happen to put it someplace on their website or somehow it gets escaped into the the uh, the wild and, and uh, the Amazon Spider finds that before you publish, then your commission will go from seventy percent to thirty percent. So how do you go? Um, how do you how do you send out for reviews and for editors and so on? But and non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> well, not no. I wouldn't even bother that because not no agreement works. I make zero agreements. Anytime you, if you have to make an agreement with somebody, you better rethink doing business with them. None of the none of the work I'm doing right now with anybody. And there's lots of money changing hands in some cases. The zero agreements. And the only people I work with is zero agreements. When somebody starts talking agreements, I know they're a novice. Because they ain't got a clue. Because no agreement is worth the scrap of paper the time is written. Well, but back on that, how do you resolve the problem of needing to send out for reviews? And well, speci uh, be specific of what type of review. Well, you said if somebody gets a hold of your book and, and that, that happens to put a segment of it on, you know, and they're on the and they Oh, that's it. fine. Cool. Yeah. That's fine, but if you, you have to publish that first on Amazon, so you'd never ask for a review until you publish your book on Amazon. Amazon always gets it first. No exception. Yeah, betcha. So one more small point about Google Plus, which is that they have communities and groups now, just like mm -hmm. the group, all the other locations, except that they're in Google's hip pocket. And so yeah. any public, anything you say on those groups, any groups you set up, all don't of be that, bad mountain Google. All of that contributes to your thought leadership, to your search rank ratings. Anything you're associated with goes up the more you participate in Google. So. Um, you know, it's another well, the other platform. thing, the other thing to be careful about too is what you say about Google, because they'll if you like start mentioning Google, they'll come after you for trademark infringement and all sorts of random stuff. So you just understand that if you're playing with Google, it's like um, it's like uh, going to eat at the mafia restaurant. They they got great food there, but you don't want to talk bad about the Dom because he might be there and his boys might take you out back. <laughs> and that's the way Google works. So, you know, if you understand the rules of the game, then you just have to, you know, you have to kiss the ring. So. So those are some of my hot tips from Rise. Yeah, and that's one of the things that we talked about in the Mastermind, too, that all of us found is that when we started using Google authorship and actually doing attributions of our content different places, the uh, traction in Google of all that content was really high. Way the, some of the best SEO you can do is to do the uh, authorship attribution. Any other uh, big tips from Rise? Um, I'll go through my notes, but this were some of the themes. Those are a few that, you know, trademark your business name. <laughs> that, was another, that was like a well, big one because it's so easy for somebody else, you know, your, your you know, ebook publishing manifest, I'm sorry, I forget the exact term. Oh, beautiful business. Be beautiful business. Well, no, the, your keywords that you're using to rank on this meetup. Oh, Book Design Mastermind. Book Design Mastermind. So somebody, you get a little popular in Book Design Mastermind, somebody thinks it's hot, they go trademark it before you, now you can't do business as Book Design Mastermind. Yes, you can. That's not the way trademarks, trademarks I, work. I had, you know, a couple of different sessions, lawyers. And no, it sessions. doesn't matter they were wrong, yeah, because yeah, trademarks yeah, work by grandfathering. Whoever uses the term first, they own that mother. Forever. 
And anybody that tells you different is trying to sell you something. If you go to the trademark website and USPTO.gov and read, you will find out that you don't have to ever register a trademark. The only people that tell you that you have to register a, tr register a trademark are, was there an attorney giving this presentation? Yeah, and then, okay, you know, so let me finish. So the attorney, so the attorney charges money to do a trademark search, which you can do free online if you if you think that that's worthwhile, which is not really. Uh, and then they'll charge you some some huge amount of money, of which you don't have to pay because you can go do it yourself at USPTO for 175 bucks. And they say, oh, but you got to pay us to do the search and the due diligence. No, no, no. All they do is they go fill out the same $175 thing and put it in, and they let the, the gnomes that work in the bowels of the PTO go through and figure out if it's gonna pass or fail. They don't do any work. They do exactly this much work. Because I've talked to these guys and I said, oh, they're all laughing. They're like, yeah, yeah, this is a great job. We can, we can, sometimes we can convince people to pay us 25, 30 grand and we go fill out the $175 form and send it in, and they'll come back and tell us, and then if they bounce it though, then we, have, well, then we tell them, oh, for another 25 or 30 grand, we can try to get it straightened out. We never do, but sometimes they pay us. So the rule of, of trademarks and copyrights is whoever uses it first gets it. That's why you'll notice I never talk about a term really until I register that domain or it's very rare. Like Beautiful Business was a little different because the domain holder, they aren't doing anything with their domain. I can't get them to sell it to me and I just like the name. I was attached to the name so I used it. But Book Design Mastermind, I went and registered that. Well, so the, the first presentation was from a lawyer. The second was from a couple marketing people. And cool. the stories of people that got the rug pulled out of them were when the big guy came in with more oh, money yep. and said, you can't. So here's how to fix that. Is if you look, uh, if you read my book about uh, the prepaid legal, in fact, I had a long conversation in our SO mastermind about this, is that when somebody sues me, I start laughing because I know I'm going to cost these people so much money. I've caused two people I know to go bankrupt. When they sued me, they went bankrupt, which is the way it should be. And the way you do it is you get, everybody know what prepaid legal coverage is? Mm -hmm. Who's got prepaid legal coverage? It's on oh. the list. <laughs> so here's the way prepaid legal works is, um, I'll give you an example. I work in the, the natural health is one of the, the areas of business I do. And I used to package a product, which I think I'm gonna start packaging again, uh, that was uh, uh, based on indium sulfate, which is a, it's just a mineral out of the periodic chart. So, indium sulfate. Indium sulfate. Indium sulfate. Yeah. So I get this nasty gram from these people saying, um, uh, you know, you violated our patent for using this, and I said, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, and they said, ah, we're going to sue you and all this nonsense. And I said, that's that's fantastic. I'll see you in court. And they started doing some diligence and looked at all the other suits I'd been participating in and noticed that none of them had ever gone through and they finally gave up. Mm -hmm. um, but the way that I do it is I have an arrangement with my attorney. So I pay, I think, $26 a month for something like 700 hours of court time now and unlimited out of court time. So what happens is, so if Octavia got torqued off at me and she decided oh, I'm going to go, I, I see David's getting traffic from Book Design Mastermind, I'm going to go, I got lots of money, I'm going to go sue him and he's going to give up and I'm going to steal it from him. That's the way these people think. It's, I mean, it's really a scam. And so Octavia sues me, then what I do is I've got an arrangement with my attorney that works in the prepaid pool and I, I um, call him up and I say, Tom, I'm about to file a prepaid legal uh, claim. And so look for that claim because I'm going to ask for you to be the attorney because otherwise you just get assigned some random person. So if you're in Austin, I'll give you the guy's name that you you like this guy. So far, about half the cases I've been involved with, they just found out this guy was on the other side of the table and they gave up that we're here local. And so um, I get Tom assigned to me and we have this simple arrangement. He gets paid for PPA legal. And so his goal is to run up as much money as as fast as possible so he gets paid the most. And so our agreement is that every, like if Octavia sued me, every piece of paperwork that her attorney files with the court, that piece of paperwork has to be responded to by my attorney. And so the, my rule of thumb is that every piece of paperwork that the opposing side files, my guy files 10 to 20 pieces of paper. 
every time. He goes through the documents, he has this team of paralegals, and they go through and they find every possible way they can fire some random piece of paperwork that, that applies to that first one. They file a response back with 20 or 30 more of these. I know one person that they, the first month they sued me, it cost them $42,000, and they get, there was no second month. Right, they, 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 because if Octavia sues me through an attorney and she runs up $42,000 worth of money, she has to write a check to her attorney for that money. She ain't getting that back, right? Unless the claim goes to court and the judge finds in my favor. But what happens then is if she can't pay, then her attorney sues her. And now they're fighting amongst each other and they've forgotten all about me, right? So that's the way I handle that. So, Tom? Pardon me? He said it was Tom that's got the... Oh, he, he's an awesome guy. Yeah, and I just accidentally got him out of the pool the first time. But that's the way you do the... That's the way you handle... The, the way that... What Octavia is talking about, they're also this uh, class of people called patent trolls that go and buy up, you know, random bankrupt companies that have some patent associated with them, and then they go out and hit all these people. Um, like in the PR news, in the press release space right now, there was some company that some patent troll bought here about eight months ago that had a patent on the electronic transmission of news. That means every website, mm -hmm. every email you send, every piece of website content you put up is all news. And they're just randomly suing people left and right. Google settled with them. Yahoo settled with them. And so they think to themselves, wow, we're going to make some money now. And so then they hit my group, right, that knows about the prepaid legal. And they, 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 as far as I know, once they hit the group of people that I work with and didn't know this trick, they hit probably 30 or 40 of them. And I'm guessing that they probably ran up several million dollars worth of money out of their pocket first month. Just because these guys are like, oh, I got sued. Rocking a good time today, buddy. Let's push back on them and see if we can cost them a few hundred thousand dollars this month. So how does prepaid legal make money if their rates are only 26 a month? The way they make money is that it's just like any insurance yeah, policy. Insurance. Um, they have, you know, probably millions of subscribers in Texas that pay that monthly fee and maybe, I don't know, 10,000 of them get sued every month. Okay. So they're always right side up. I mean, it's a it's a fantastic no, model. A lot of large numbers game. Yeah, it's the and they got some large numbers. And very few redeem, kind of like an insurance right. policy. Very yeah. few redeem. Is that Zoom right. law is that using? No prepaid legal. Oh, and, prepaid and also it's legal. called it's called Legal Shield now. And there's so many scams out there that when you um, I put the link in my book of the the actual website link that is their real link and their real phone number. So just use that. That's that's the right one. There, I mean, there's all sorts of scams out there right now. Yeah. Legal the, Shield is the right one. Yeah, Legal Shield is what it used to be prepaid and they changed their name. One other cool resource I found for the show and tell is um, Evan Pagan has a productivity PDF that he's put out that was really good. Helped me clarify some of the yeah. what to do activities, high profit stuff and cool. And well, send me a link to it and I'll what send you it. Should do daily. Yeah. I'll send it out to the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anytime anybody finds a cool resource online, send it to me and I'll send it out to the group. Even Pagan is a Resource. Yeah, he's a good guy. A anything else from Rise? It was a good. Um, mm. Mm. That's those are um, those are those are the hot ones. I didn't know that Mailchimp could send video emails. I haven't tried it, but these marketing lady said that they did. That you could send video email through Mailchimp. I send all my email through Media because the deliverability is like. Yeah. 100 percent and i'd be careful with those video because they've got the image of the video and when people are in the uh preview pane it's like display images below so people automatically know oh this is some kind of html or some kind of sales pitch or company so i think Maybe. that limits the usefulness of video yeah, email would, even though a lot of people are touting it yeah the video email is it's a it's a fairly new Thing and it's just like any other new thing. It, it might even work for a while, but then there's yeah. probably going to be a breakover point where it starts working really you just poorly. just think of how people use email. It's usually friends and family, and you're just sending little short conversations back and forth. Yeah. So if they see, click here to display images below, they know that's not from someone they know. So usually they can just, the old uh, Gary Halbert, you got your A pile messaging and your B pile. B pile messaging, yeah. Those just skips right over. And a lot of times I don't even delete it out or open it. So. Cool. 
that's Any, about it. Anything I, else? I went to a good video session, but if, you know, if people want to know about video, they can approach me afterwards. The cool. one exception is Gmail to Gmail. Like if you're sending a YouTube video, it'll actually play inside of their uh, mail account, so they don't have any of those. And and play images below or whatever they can. You can have yep. a little text message, and then the email will, or the video will play right there inside their inbox. And for, and for the most part, I mean, it's still the the best option is to just you know send an email and direct people to resources like yeah you know instead of sending a PDF attachment, send them to a link where it is or a video. Yeah, I've been going through the I Love Marketing podcast series they did on email, and they're like, yeah, the only two things you should get out of an email, based on the way most people use it. You want to either get them to reply back or direct them like to some resource. To a resource. Yeah. So, because you can control the layout of the web page, you don't have to worry about how it's going to show up in their email and all those other factors. Yeah. Any other show and tells? I got a couple of show and tells. These are these are these are really funny. Um, this one is um, by uh, Epticus, um, and it's it's interesting. I'm going to read it and then I'm going to tell you who. Does anybody know who Epticus was? <coughs> Ah, good. Uh, a scholar here, yeah. So, whenever you try pleasing others, you'll be misdirected to what lies outside your sphere of influence. In doing so, you'll lose your hold on your life's purpose. Content yourself with being a lover of wisdom and seeker of truth. Continue to return to and retrace through what is essential and valuable to you. The waters of joy spring from the fountain, uh, the fountain of self-reference, completing only those things you are internally driven to complete. Now this is really interesting because Epicus was a slave, and he's telling he's saying that your credo, my credo, and yours also is, you know, don't be trying to please other people. Mm -hmm. And he's a slave, right? On penalty of death, he's supposed to please other people. Mm -hmm. But he's got his internal reference and his external reference. He's got those separated. He lived. Um, uh, estimates are he was born someplace between 55 to 60 A.D. and died around 120 A.D. And I'll send out a link to this. This is a recent republishing of his um, work. But he's a really, really, really interesting guy. And he, he talks a lot about uh, only um, only paying attention to the things that are in your control. And the guy's a slave, right? And so he's saying, you know, the, the difference between joy being in a joyful state and a constantly sad, depressed state is only focus on the things you can control. But this is really interesting because this guy's a slave, right? So he's worked it out. Like, you know, for him, what might have been in his control was how, you know, masterfully he could have done whatever task he was assigned that day. And that really, if you get down to it, that's the whole practice of meditation in most, uh, most traditions, too. So now this is a fascinating book. The name of this book is The Beginner's Guide for the Recently Deceased, A Comprehensive Travel Guide to the Only Inevitable Destination. So you're meant to read this book after you're dead. So, so that's, a, that's a twister to begin with. Um, make people want to read it. Yeah, so uh, let's see here. Make sure I've got the... I'm looking at that cover. How important do you think covers are on the e-books? Um, that is not a good cover. That, that's a whole long conversation. Yeah. yeah so hugely what, important. Yeah, it's hugely important. And if you look at the, my beautiful business book, I specifically wrote that cover so that it would pop or it would stand out inside Amazon. So this cover, you know, if you're thinking about looking at this cover on an iPhone or an Android phone in black and white, mm, not so good. Yeah. So this is um, uh, this is a little short um, uh, bit out of this book, which I found pretty fascinating. So um, uh, this is called the reorganization, and um, uh, Stom is the guy's name, if I'm saying that correctly. It, which, by the way, I've got this guy on my bucket list to meet now. I like meeting authors. Um, earlier, we compared the relative visible motion of astral matter, so astral matter meaning the substance that's in non-physical reality. Uh, to physical matter with that of a go-go dancer, which is astral, and a brick, which is physical matter. Um, and th by the way, this is just particle and string theory, too, if you know anything about particle physics. I mean, they, basically this guy is talking, It's a this book is a mashup of the um, the Tibetan Book of the Dead and string, and, <laughs> and string theory and particle theory. One of the most fascinating books I've ever read. I don't get how a go-go dancer is astral. They're talking about the frequency at which uh, waves and particles uh, vibrate are, are perceivable in non-physical uh, reality, which is 
anyway, we'll, we'll go ahead. It's, yeah, this suggest, is something for you yeah, just to, to buy the book and read it. And I mean, I've read some of these chapters and pondered on them for many days. Um, so uh, uh, astral matter, um, just, just how well astral matter go-goes, moves in other words, however, depends on whether it has to dance with a physical counterpart, which is a physical body. So astral matter that doesn't have a physical compartment or counterpart, uh, which would be now the person's dead, can shake all at once. But astral matter, matter with a physical counterpart, i.e. a body, is relatively constrained and moves slowly. Now that your physical body, and this is just so funny, now that your physical body is gone, so you're supposed to be reading this after you're dead, uh, the cord we spoke about earlier is broken and your astral body is entirely free to boogie for all it's worth. Mm. And it, this, this ensuing shakedown of boogie time is what we call reorganization. So matter can be divided into categories based on relative density, which this is particle and wave and string theory now. Um, it's physical in the physical world these categories were called solids to liquids gases astral matter can be similarly divided according to its relative densities and just as physical matter has an enormous number of subdivisions within each division different types of solids for example there's a similarly large number of divisions in astral matter so your astral body can be composed of any combination of grades in other words different vibratory frequencies of matter from this broad range so while physical matter was moved, shaped, altered, and otherwise responsive to physical forces, i.e. gravity and other forces, astral matter is moved, shaped, altered, and otherwise responsive to your feelings. So feelings, emotions, desires, passions are powerful astral forces or non-physical or extra-physical forces. And different types of feeling move different grades of astral matter. The permutations of hate, for example, such as fear, hostility, contempt, move the coarser grades, lower frequencies. The permutations of love, such as reverence, respect, compassion, honor, move the finer, higher frequency ranges. So the grades of matter that make up your astral body, and this is really interesting. So the, now we're getting into the Tibetan Book of the Dead stuff. So the, the grades of astral matter that make up your astral body are the grades of matter you attracted to it with your feelings when you were alive. This is uh, it's starting to get interesting here. So what happens in the reorganization after the physical form drops is the same that happens when you take a glass of murky pond water and you shake it up, set it out, and you leave it to stand. The particles begin to settle and migrate and separate according to their relative densities. So released from their physical counterpart, the matter of your astral body does the same. So uh, for example, um, if you spent your life consumed with bitterness, you've attracted and built around your astral body the type of astral matter that's responsive to this, the frequency of bitterness. During reorganization, this matter will migrate and settle where the coarser grades settle in the outermost layers of your astral body and the lowermost. And the outermost layer acts as a power, per, powerful perceptional filter like a colored glass. It only allows a narrow range of experience or light through and reflects everything else. Therefore, it only allows through experiences that conform to and are there, therefore provoke this feeling, in this instance, bitterness. So your astral experience is limited to the range of feelings to which the matter of your outermost layer can respond. This filtering is so effective that it's actually impossible to experience anything else. The bad news is your astral experience begins um, as reflections of your worst of your character and so they always begin as bad as they can get. Good news is that whatever these experiences are, they're all self-created and highly temporary. So even the most entrenched behaviors eventually begin to fatigue and dissolve and uh, destabilize and evaporate. With, the, with time, the outermost layers of your astral body dissipate, wear away. When this happens, the matter of the layers beneath slowly come into play. So as your astral life progresses, no matter how dire it begins, it can only improve. So it's interesting to me that this guy has done a, everybody knows what a mashup is, where they take different sources and put them together like a Google Maps mashup. This guy has, in simple English language, been able to translate quantum string theory, particle theory, and the Tibetan Book of the Dead in a way that anybody can understand. So my point in reading this is that if you've got something in your brain that you know about, that you think is really complex, 
you know, check into books like this and, and, wa and look at the way that people use their analogies and bounce around between um, uh, comparison technologies so you can explain whatever you know about to other people. So anyway, they were just um, uh, cur curious books to me. What is the name of that book? Oh, this is, um, this is The Beginner's Guide for the Recently Deceased, a, com a Comprehensive Travel Guide to the Only Inevitable Destination. And his second book, let's see if he's got the name in here. Um, Lacey, do you remember the name of that book? It was... Which one? It was... Um, uh, a guide to sex in the afterlife, or something that we, we we were talking about his books. So it's a book about um, how sex works in the afterlife, which you're supposed to read after you're dead. Mm -hmm. And he also says, and you know, boy, don't you wish you knew this when you were alive? Yeah, Dan. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's uh, the guy's second book, and I've I've yet to, I figured I'd read his first book. I started reading the second book, and it was it's fascinating. So I went back to read the, the first book to start with. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm so sorry about that. I have to head now. Uh, awesome. Uh, we'll see you next time. Well, let's take maybe a, a, a uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you so much and have a wonderful weekend. Okay, excellent. thank you. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm sorry, but uh, my job is uh, oh, that's fine. Okay. That's cool. So, let's take maybe uh, 10 minutes and then we'll just come back for a, a, a quick or long wrap up, however, it works out, and we'll talk about um. <coughs> Uh, where we'd like to go with the group next, which you know, my, my thinking is that having the tools to really publish fast is probably one of the, the con contributing things that I'm going to give to the group. Uh, and anyway, we can talk about that. Uh, we'll take maybe five or ten minutes. People can go to the bathroom and we'll kick up again.